What if pedaling 80 kilometers a day for 80 days I could cross America from coast to coast? Would that be possible? I questioned myself for a long time until I decided I wanted to give it a try. I have no experience of this size. This is exactly why I wanted to try, to understand where my limits are. But the real limit here is time. Well beyond my will, I will not be able to stay on American soil beyond the 90 days of my visa. Time is therefore inflexible. Will I succeed in this adventure? It's May 20th when I leave Washington DC on a very hot day and with a heavy bicycle. I avoid exaggerated ambitions. I set myself only two goals, to proceed west as far as I go and to document my journey. At the moment, I'm not revealing my plan to anyone. I remain vague, saying I want to go to Pittsburgh and who knows, maybe even Colorado. America has its own geographical obstacles and to cross the Appalachians I pedal along the rivers, taking advantages of the old abandoned railways. Pittsburgh can be reached from Washington DC entirely pedaling on dirty roads and away from traffic. I will ride two interconnected tracks, the CNO, almost 300 km long, and the Gap, over 240 k long, which leads to the outskirts of Pittsburgh. It looks like a jungle here, water, forest and a very humid heat. Civilization is not too far anyway, we are right in a river park. My adventure begins with camping. However, these are just campsites, places where it is allowed to stay overnight. You do not pay, but there are no services. On the third day, a long section of my path is closed due to mud. It is the first real encounter with difficulties, with that series of problems which are not easy to foresee, and even if you foresee them, you cannot avoid them. Proceeding inland, towards the mountains, the second unexpected event arrives. The trail is closed due to works in a tunnel. You need to go up the hill along a steep and bumpy path. Day 5, I start the gap, the route that leads to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The CNO Canal is over, this is the gap. The gap stands for Great Allegheny Passage. I hope I pronounce it right. The landscape is totally different today. We are on the outskirts of uh, still in Cumberland. And uh, for instance, I follow a rail and the landscape is not flat. I face long climbs and I proceed very slowly, seeing no progress. I begin to be worried because these are just hills compared to the Rocky Mountains in the famous Colorado. The journey is long and lonely. I have plenty of time to think. It is not true that all thoughts are abandoned. If anything, now the concerts are for the objectively important things. Eating, drinking and resting. I also document and talk to keep myself company. Documenting might be useful, not only for me. The gap is great, in excellent condition. Nature here in Pennsylvania is amazing. Like the pioneers on a wagon caravan, I too follow the rivers to compensate for the differences in height. We look for the route that has fewer hills towards a predefined place. I only ride through small and quiet communities. Day 8, Montour Trail. Finally made it, made it uh, to the third trail actually. Uh, I'm glad because I feel like a, a section, uh, a section is done. That means like uh, Washington, Pittsburgh, basically. Day 8, 
I start the Montour Trail, essentially a bypass around Pittsburgh. The Montour alternates dirty roads with asphalt, avoiding traffic through a large number of bridges. I want this trip to be away from big cities. I have many reasons for that. Larger cities are difficult to navigate and might lead to many distractions. I realized that I have already traveled over 500k and I only stopped at a very few traffic lights. What a privilege! After the Montour, I take the Panhandle Trail, heading west, which is paved and very fast, and at the end of which I find myself in West Virginia between once prosperous and now decadent cities. The Yankee Trail and the Pioneer Trail eventually leads me to Wheeling, where I will not find a place to sleep. I am forced to cross the river Ohio and to sleep precisely in Ohio. I'm in Ohio! I have never been this far from home. I have never gone beyond nine days traveling by bike. I feel different emotions. I am excited but also worried. I feel far away, but in the big picture Ohio is just a little west of the Atlantic coast. I still have so much to do and looking at the map makes me anxious. In Ohio I face harsh reality. Once the dirt roads and cycle paths are over, I now have to share the road with cars. The fastest roads are unpleasant. The secondary roads are better, but they don't avoid any gradients. These are continuous ups and downs that put me to the test. Yeah, I'm gonna check the map, I want to see whether it is like this till the evening or not. Ohio, Ohio and its consequences. Ohio is killing me. Uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill. It's a amazing exercise under a strong sun. Traveling as the ancients did is not easy. I have already thought that my journey was comparable to that of the settlers in a caravan, when I really have the opportunity to compete with the Amish in a single horsepower carriage. I am stronger, perhaps even more resilient. Who knows, I express a power of two horsepower, but must be said, I'm not pushing a carriage. Cycling lengthens life. 10 days is like having lived 20. The passing of the time is in fact only a perception. The more things you do, the more you see and the more you seem to have lived. But many of these things are not going as I have planned. It's not about grinding kilometers. It's more like a treasure hunt, a video game with various levels with missions of increasing difficulties. It takes a lot of mental stamina and determination. It's not just cycling. As I run out of water continuously, I understand that I will have to organize myself better. Uh, again, I had to stop and ask for some water as I cannot carry more than uh, three water bottles and it wouldn't make any sense. And but uphill and extreme heat uh, make me drink so much that I don't have other solutions, so I'm gonna be helped. <sighs> so now I've got a bottle of <laughs> completely ice frozen water, but plus uh, one that wasn't frozen and it's already here. Not only I ignore my condition, 
by even my limits. After every climb I feel like I'm dying. Clearly I don't die. I'm there every evening. I'm spending all my money in drinks. In Zanesville, I make the decision to ship some excess weight home. I have not regretted, except that this package will never arrive at its destination. Alright, this is my new setting. Now there is this, the, the Ortley black bag um, is like missing. Before it was like this position on my back. Now I will keep my sleeping bag over here. I probably need to buy a dry bag for that. Right, the point is I have shipped the, the bag and other items back to Sweden. And um, for that I have paid $80. Uh, $80 for less than four kilos. So was that worth it? Probably yes. A journey of this kind is made by peaks of happiness and parentheses of discouragement, like on an emotional roller coaster. I think it's normal. You can get angry, annoyed, and then rejoice again. On the 13th day, having completed the first 1000 kilometers of travel, I felt tired. Tired of this routine for the first time. Body aches, insect bites, rain. Ideally, it would be appropriate to stop one day a week, but I can't afford it. Cycling every day is like working hard seven days a week. So I decided to stop one day in Circleville, Ohio. The town is certainly not a popular destination, but I must say it has its charm. I don't see cyclists around, nor tourism. There are also few pedestrians. People are very outgoing, curious and sociable. Everyone talks to everyone and this gives the impression that they have known each other for years, but maybe they haven't. Yesterday I had some, uh, let's say, camping problem. I was uh, um, like six miles north of here. And um, um, the lady at the, uh, in the office told me that that wouldn't make much sense to camp there as they would have let me pay as a camper van. I would take the whole space no matter with a tent or a bicycle. So the price was like 49 plus taxes, little over $50 would have been. So she told me go south, six miles, like uh, half an hour riding. And uh, there is another camping, this Morgan's. Um, well, Morgan's had the same price. So I, cycle, I cycled south, let's say for nothing. And now today I'm heading north. <laughs> again while in this uh, north to south south to north actually i have to go just west but the good thing is that i've discovered this trail which follows the little miami river 
and it's so cool like it's paved it's fast it's in the shadow mostly as you see so 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 day 16 uh, my target is today the state of Indiana less tourism and fewer cyclists mean fewer structured design for those who don't travel with cars or caravan it's not unusual to pay over $40 a campground in the eastern United States off the bike trails. Here everyone travels by car or camper, so even a cyclist in a tent pays for the entire pitch. I thought once I passed the Appalachians and arrived in western Ohio, the climbs would be over. I was wrong. Rivers in this part of the United States are much lower elevation than the highlands through which they flow. They are in valleys with steep banks. Steep descents are punctually followed by demanding climbs. In the proximity of rivers, there might be two or three hill ridges, lasting kilometers. At the moment, I don't see too many differences between Ohio and Indiana. Same forest similar sudden climbs. The towns that I cross are the positive note of the journey, otherwise the landscape here is rather repetitive and not worthy of a note. When lunchtime comes, I look for a library or even a bank. I sit outside and connect to their Wi-Fi. It is the right time to communicate with Europe and I feel less lonely. From here I observe the flow of the small towns. We do not have in Europe and in Italy or Sweden uh, this kind of concept which is the motel uh, which is a basically a ground floor one level type of hotel which is thought to be for the motorists near uh, motorways, uh, interstate of, um, and uh, and I would say Oxovidare Posvenska and so on and um, so we don't have this concept which is you know uh, not not classy at all it's not elegant but it's practical you park and you are in um, a ground level and uh, so it's easy to check in it is easy to check out you can park probably your car in front of your door uh, I'm not gonna leave my bicycle outside when this is cool because we should have more places like this in Europe and uh, uh, you know places where this is your door and you enter and you store your bicycle right inside and you spend the night with uh, the minimum comfort you know TV fridge microwave toilet and a super large bed. I proceed not only against the wind, but also the so-called common sense, basically what leads people to live a life in an armchair. Or in a car. Despite cycling so much, I don't feel worse than when I have sat for too long. I am testing myself, but not just physically. I'm testing my bike, my equipment, and experimenting with the jet stream, the pattern of prevailing winds which mostly blow from the southwest. Too bad, because I'm going in exactly the opposite direction, but I was aware of it. I have decided to leave from the East Coast, like the pioneers, to conquer the Great West. To me, it makes much more sense as I come from the East, although across the Atlantic. Two women on a car, <laughs> they just hand, hand me this bottle of water, asking if I was okay. You know, it's a, it's, it's a bottle of fresh cold 
cold water and I really wonder why they do this. They are so, so kind. The 20th day, pedaling on Route 40, after almost a thousand miles from the start, I arrive in Illinois. Every town has a water tower and its name on it. Each new state is for me a small milestone. This area of the Midwest has still a good frequency of towns. Approximately every 25 kilometers you can expect one. There is about three towns a day. Cities are like islands on dry land. Small oases that is absolutely worth visiting, both from a break from the saddle and for refreshment. I am aware that the cities will become scarce and the islands will be represented by the gas stations. I'm getting deeper and deeper into the states. At the moment, it is a huge agricultural landscape mixed with woods. The cornfield offer very little to the tourist and for those coming from Europe, all this is a deja vu. On the 23rd day, while still in Illinois, I reached another so-called milestone, Route 66. Oh my God, oh my God, look the road I am crossing, encounters with famous route, finally, I'm crossing the route 66, if I would, if I would go to Santa Monica, Los Angeles, California, I would take this all the way south or southwest. I never thought I'd get this far, up to here with the only strength of my legs, by bicycle. It's amazing what you can do with such a basic tool by just pushing two pedals. The next day I arrive at the Illinois-Missouri border represented by the Mississippi. This too is a great emotion. I feel in the heart of America but I'm still far from the center or the middle of my journey. On the same day, I start the third big dirt road after the CNO and the Gap. This is located entirely in Missouri and it is the longest in the nation. I will have to travel it for 280 miles, that is 450k. The Katy Trail in fact offers the possibility to connect to Kansas City via the link road called Rock Island Spur. Those who wondered why cycling in the States might now have the answer, because here there are routes entirely dedicated to bicycles and of an exorbitant length. Kansas to Texas Railway. There is no train anymore, but this is an ex, uh, a former railway. And consequently, there are a couple of nice bridges like this one. And uh, well, this is how it looks the trail. Everything is perfect except the heat. The weather is terrible. The Katy Trail was a railroad, the old railroad that connected Kansas and Texas. There are several former stations and small villages along the way. Sometimes I'm happy not to read about places in order to leave room for surprises. For example, I did not know about St. Charles and it was a wonderful discovery.
The trail follows the huge Missouri River. The dirt road is dusty and not always easy. The heat is now up to 38 degrees Celsius. It looks like the rainforest and I'm forced to make many small stops. It happens to find a close hotel or hostel and rethink how and where to sleep. A bit like the homeless and in fact I'm a homeless here in the States. It's very easy on this trail to get caught up in conversation with other riders. There are many riders here for obvious reasons. I would like, but I can't. I can't really stop a stage just for the pleasure of socializing. Americans are so similar yet so different from us. In my opinion, they are more sociable and committed, more devoted to the others. This might be due to religion, but not only. Typically, they ask you if you need anything, and that's a conversation starter. Americans are talkative. They have bigger dreams, ambitions and plans. It seems like they don't set limits. On the 30th day, having arrived in Sedalia, I find myself making my first assessments. A month on the road is much more than I imagined. It would be enough to travel even just a month a year like this, to fill one's life. I decided to change pace and take better care of my diet. I understood that my breakfast must be much more caloric and that I must keep on drinking and eating during the ride. All in this way I can keep the performance high. And it just seems to work. Today I cycled 118k on dirt road and I didn't feel tired like the past days. I get to the end of the Katy Trail and after 450 kilometers of dust and gravel I'm even delighted to find the asphalt again. I'm in the outskirts of uh, Kansas City, the Kansas side. I'm happy to say that I'm in Kansas City. It gives me a feeling of distance. However, I decided to bypass the city through its residential suburbs. I see the modern apartment flats again after a month. This thing is unbelievable. Had I traveled through most of Europe, this one type of housing would have defined the landscape almost every day. The city is another life and it will be another journey. For this trip, I have picked a route that tries to avoid large urban areas. Day 32, still in and around Kansas City, Kansas side. Even Kansas looks flat on the map, but it's not. Rivers and the Ice Age have carved out valleys and brought out hills. Kansas is on the way for those who are heading or coming from Colorado. Uh, and not to spoil our friends from Kansas, but uh, except from uh, farmland, I don't, I don't see much. I mean, the agricultural landscape here has been parceled out into huge blocks of countryside. Roads form a huge grid, at least 15k on each side. 
This is America that feeds America, even though much of this food is for the livestock itself. Hello! Hello! Since cattle are literally everywhere here, I'm developing a sympathy, a complicity with these animals never experienced before. Hello! You're coming with me, right? Yeah, let's go! Let's go to Colorado! Oh. Hello! Hello! The climate is hot and humid, with almost daily risk of big thunderstorms. The news is like psychological terrorism. However, I cannot underestimate the weather warnings because this is a tornado zone. According to the alerts, I should avoid traveling, which is impossible for me. The weather changes quickly and the forecasts retract, causing anxiety. There is always wind and little or no shelter. I'm cycle as fast as I can, uphill, downhill, to Mankato, Kansas. This is because of a weather warning in the area, all counties involved, risk of severe thunderstorm. I mean, there is a the high chance, it doesn't mean it's gonna happen, but this is the forecast. A man sitting on a car handed me a $20 bill. He told me I might need it. I guess people are very worried about me riding in the summer heat. I was very embarrassed about the $20, but it would have been rude not to accept it. The man was happy to help me out. It's his help and I can't refuse it. Nobody cycles in this area. The bulk of cycling traffic flows on the Transamerica, which is further south. I was told that people commonly associate bikers with poor people. Of course, traveling like this is a very cheap way to cross a country, but since you are slow, the journey takes longer and it still costs a lot. a little concern about this area of the United States. Distances between cities are becoming important, but I thought worse, or maybe the worst is to come. And it came. Around here, Small town parks permit camping, though water and electricity aren't guaranteed. The feeling I have now is to live at gas stations. Here we drink, we eat, we go to the bathroom. Here you can breathe fresh air thanks to the air conditioning. Wi-Fi available here too. Sometimes it's the only shade available in miles. Gas stations are public services. There might be nothing but there must be at least a gas station. On my 36th day, I am for the first time a guest of the so-called warm shower network. The people here seem friendlier than usual to me. On day 37, now in Nebraska, I have my first puncture. I have now traveled for almost 3,000 kilometers without puncturing, but it won't be the last time. The landscape is changing rapidly. 
Small towns always capture my imagination and this is where I find myself taking pictures the most. This geographical area is called the Great Plains. However, the area is not flat, although there are no mountains either. And here used to be full of bisons, but now it's cows. Proceeding west, the climate becomes dry, but hot. The soil is visibly more arid, less green. It is a known fact. The soil becomes poorer, the weather drier, and there is less space for agriculture. Therefore, it seems that the countryside is not as wealthy. The wind has the power to reduce the enthusiasm of every cyclist. Day 39! It's very windy today. And I mean it. The wind is from the south. It is mostly side winds, but my road goes southwest at times. So the wind is almost headwind. Anyway, it's a problem. It is a big problem, you see. Massive. Today I have a task to ride 40 miles until McCook. In McCook, I even thought about taking the train to skip the days of scorching heat and get to Denver. But I don't have to go to Denver, but to Fort Collins. I decided not to compromise and try my best. It wouldn't be nice to have to admit to myself that I caught a train in the middle of the States. I decided though to give myself a rule to observe. I will call it the rule of number 35. If the temperature is above the 35 degrees Celsius, with wind above 35 km per hour, I will not ride, I will rest or move around as little as necessary. I'm not pedaling, I'm not pedaling, I'm not touching the pedals, I'm just going because there is a strong wind from the south. The temperature is uh, 37, which is 98 Fahrenheit. Strong southerly wind. This is why I have decided to do a very, very short distance and moving from the camping to the hotel because it was not possible to stay exposed in the camping today with such a temperature as I wouldn't uh, ride anywhere. Well, the reason is that if I would have, if I would have need to go north, I would have used this this southerly wind. But uh, the stage was heading west, and this would have been uh, in a very strong side wind. I immediately applied this rule: the heat is fierce, and the wind gives no respite. I'll stop in the last city of Nebraska for those traveling west. Imperial. Here I do my best to fix all the inner tubes, heavily punctured by a bush that produced terrible thorns for every cyclist, the goat head. This only grows in the west and so far in fact I hadn't had any problems. I'm taking a break, staying in town, I have uh, fixed my tires, I have put inner tubes with sealant, hopefully I will minimize the, the puncture problem. We will see. From Imperial, Nebraska to Holy Hoke, Colorado, there are 65k of nothing, no services. My breaks have all been on the side of the road, on the sun. During the windiest moment, I felt like uphill climb. I'll have to get used to this new problem because yes, I made it to Colorado. It took me 42 days from Washington, D.C. This was one of my goals. Ordinary people see me as an athlete, 
but the truth is that an extremely trained and determined person can complete the entire coast to coast in 42 days. I, on the other hand, I'm just half away there and I can't even see the mountains yet. between 260 and 280 so I'm gonna check later how much is that that means me plus the bicycle of course everything I have on it including my clothes water bottles and so on I really love discovering this small town this is called Haxton they are always made by a water tower with the city name on it and uh, the huge silos for agriculture like corn, wheat and so on. The American dream is strong on every photo, film or postcard. When you are in it, it's just a life like any other. Everything is just relatively beautiful, it depends. Crossing only small towns I keep wondering what life is like here for those who live here. It's hard to imagine myself in their shoes. I have been going through a lot of agricultural landscape and pastures for over a month now, but I'm a city person. I obviously feel a bit alien. I drink a lot, and the more you drink, the more water becomes a problem. The landscape turns to desert. They are the priories those degraded and conditioned by low rainfall. The soil is sandy and does not allow large vegetation. Still, the landscape is becoming interesting here, bleak but beautiful. Colorado is spooky at times. Briggsdale uh, an hour ago now I'm in direction of Fort Collins I'm so happy I can see the mountains the Rocky Mountains I've been gaining altitude imperceptibly since Kansas City now I'm clearly over 1000 meters above sea level I have arrived in Fort Collins on July the 3rd, day 45, after 3,380 kilometers. I am a warm shower guest again. The family that hosts me proposed me not to leave the next day, July the 4th, with a very busy mountain road. Fort Collins though became my second day of layover since the beginning of my trip. The city is at the foot of the Rocky Mountains and from today everything changes. Day 47. Yesterday I didn't cycle. I took a day off. I have been a guest of a warm shower, warm shower family. 
the network of cyclists giving mutual support and hospitality. So I was in Fort Collins at the feet of the Rocky Mountains and today it's my first day and I will be climbing. The problem is as usual the weather and the associated thunderstorm, summer thunderstorm, it is raining, starting to rain now. So I need to get already shelter. So I just took an amazing thunderstorm shower as a welcome to the Rocky Mountains. I have waited a long time for this moment. Climbs worry me, but it's a test. If I fail here, I'll never reach my destination. They told me about beautiful pastures, flowers, hoods, and very cool temperatures. I have imagined them like the Alps, but for several reasons, they have nothing to do with the Alps. I stopped for a beer. The bartender, as soon as he heard where I'm coming from, he offered me a drink. I arrived at the highest point of my whole trip. I slept at almost 3000 meters and the next day I complete the climb up to the Cameron Pass at 3132 meters. Everything here is radically different. The era of the Anthropocene seems to be over. There is much more nature, but a pity about those devastating fires. There is much more state property here and free camping will not be a problem. Throughout the Midwest it was not possible because you can't stay overnight between private properties and cornfields. In Walden, Colorado, a tiny town at 2500 meters, I finally joined the Transamerica Trail, a route designed in the 70s and traveled by thousands of cyclists every year. Hundreds would sit in the entire coast to coast. I won't be alone here anymore and that's a good thing because in some places you treasure the company of others and motivate and support each other. Here there is also a network of ad hoc services for cyclists with even free facilities. This is the magic of Transamerica, certainly the most beautiful and famous cycling route in the world. It's day 49 when I reach Saratoga, Wyoming. I don't know anything about Wyoming. I only know that it is huge and almost uninhabited. I will definitely see some good ones. I think it's a little salt lake. This is the most remote and depopulated place in the United States. Wyoming is as big as the United Kingdom, while having only the inhabitants of Manchester. Here I cycle all the time above 2000 meters of altitude, averaging over 100k a day, crossing steppe and semi-desert climates that I didn't know were possible up here. Nothing to do with the Alps, of course. The internet, the phone signal doesn't work and that's the rule here. In Wyoming I slept three times in spaces managed by the local church. After Saratoga I ended up in the abandoned village of Jeffrey City and then in Dubois. I have arrived in Jeffrey City, Wyoming, the windiest 
day of the entire trip. I can't stand it. But literally, like, I can't stand with my bicycle. I didn't know anything about Wyoming and there is nothing around me, but that doesn't mean it isn't spectacular. The West is revealed at its best. Lonely roads and a sort of self-management of one's being. Taking into account seeing forest, desert, multicolored rock, snow peaks, rivers, lakes, geyser and steppes, I can easily say it is the most diverse and wildest place I ever visited. Transamerica is not designed by chance, it is clear. This is not the shortest route, but the most challenging and complex. Two of the most famous national parks, the Yellowstone and the Grand Teton, are located in Wyoming. This is day 54 and the landscape approaching the Teton National Park and the Yellowstone is becoming beautiful by the mile. The closer we get, the more beautiful it gets. It is right here in the Grand Teton that I take two days off. I go up to a total of four days off from the beginning of my adventure. I had time to reflect and make some balance. I don't know how I would like my life to be. A sedentary existence does not suit me. But the frenzy of this journey is also an exaggeration. Here I rediscover the beauty of sharing happiness. I'm already worried about the down that I will experience once I return to my usual life. It will take me some time to get used to it. But why having to get used to it?
I'm progressing well now, but I'll need to handle, eventually, let's say a coast to coast that is not fully completed. I wasn't aware of this route until last year, I wasn't even dreaming of it. Come what may then, I should be happy in any case, I'm doing something memorable. It is perhaps a luxury, but it was a good idea to have chosen it. Day 59, Montana. I'm going to a town called Ennis and tonight I'm gonna be a guest of the Worm Shower Network. Let's see. Day 59, I leave Wyoming and descend down to Ennis, Montana at 1,500 meters. It is the lowest altitude for over a month, precisely from Fort Collins. Although the night is still very cold, now I find the daytime heat again, but also the wind. Too much wind. Day 60, I unfortunately have to stop in Ennis, applying my own rule of 35. The town is touristy and pretty, but this stop breaks my enthusiasm. Am I not wasting too much time? Will I be able to reach Eugene and then Portland? What I do know is that the next day I manage, leaving early in the morning, to leave Ennis. The wind is less intense and I can quit with my Rule 35. To reach Dillon you need to cross a mountain pass, one of the many on the route. One of the highlights of Montana are the abandoned mining towns. Some have actually flourished thanks to tourism. Approaching Dill, the landscape surprises me again. It still turns toward the semi-desert. Yet another rain shadow area, I guess. In Dillon, I am the only guest at the bike camp, a free facility that I gladly donated to. The next day, day 62, I have the confirmation. We are in a valley that sees very little rain a year, as much as Tripoli in Libya. I didn't expect to find desert in Montana as well, but every western state has one, no matter how far north you are. Dillon is at the same altitude and latitude of Cortina d'Ampezzo, a famous ski resort and winter destination. This is why the comparison with the Alps is misleading. The very hot, dry upwind and the climb forces me to get off and push for a few kilometers. There is no telephone signal at all. When this bar closes, it cuts off the only Wi-Fi in the area, and you are alone again, with no communication possible.
after wise river its wisdoms turn. It might also be because of the names, but this area has all the flavor of the American frontier. The whole area is so depopulated that you have to rely on these tiny villages as if they were platforms on the high seas. At Wisdom I get back on track, the Transamerica. The solitude of even the places designed for camping is amazing. Here I light a fire to ward off mosquitoes and hide the food to avoid bears. Montana is no less windy than Wyoming, which is no less windy than Nebraska or Kansas. It is important to take this into consideration. I'm so unlucky with the wind, you know. I'm going north and the wind blows from the north. And I'm not moving. I have to pedal downhill. I change valley and it's green once again. Hamilton and especially Missoula are the big cities of the region. Traffic lights, pedestrians, people on bike, cafes. It's nice to breathe in the city's vibes every now and then. Wait, 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 wait. Maybe it's the wind's fault, but carrying on like this every day is pushing me down. I felt tired today, tired in general, mentally and physically. The truth is that I already feel the end of my adventure. The border with Idaho is a stone's throw away and I want two things that are antithetical to each other. To arrive, that is, to finish successfully, but also not wanting everything to end like this. Day 67. I'm in Montana, close to Idaho. Um, there are no towns around, so last night was a camping night, as you can see from the background. Um, tonight will be again a camping night there are no towns maybe there is like a restaurant and uh, some stop station like toilet and water other than that no shops no grocery no gas station where to buy little things Even too hot, <laughs> even too hot.
the US Route 12, which runs along the Loxa River, was an epitome of wonder. In Idaho, even words become redundant. July is coming to an end. I'm at almost 5,400 kilometers from the starting point. Day 70! 70 days on the road, Idaho! I follow now the Salmon River course, like a blue line in a golden landscape. Then it will be the Snake River. The landscape changes continuously based on altitude and humidity. The heat is rising sharply and it will reach over 40 degrees Celsius. Day 71, Idaho. Not too far from Oregon, by the way. My power bank is not working anymore. It doesn't charge. It charges itself, but it doesn't charge my devices. I didn't know that power banks and iPhones stop charging at high temperatures. I was thinking it was the cables, but in the evening everything started charging again normally. Hey, Camel, we got us a whistle. Cambridge, what do you think of that? In Cambridge, a town of only 600 inhabitants, I not only came across a rodeo, but I found a gentleman who wanted to offer me a ticket. This is something that doesn't happen if you travel by car. It is precisely the bicycle that brings people together. By bike, you are the spokesman for a type of travel outside the box. I left without admitting or declaring my final destination to myself or to others. I arrived in the United States. To the many who asked me, I said that my destination would be Colorado, simply west. Americans understand what it means, ideally. This simple and hasty answer worked for 42 days, until I arrived in Colorado and at a gas station with some people I had to recalibrate my destination. I want to go all the way to Oregon, I said. I have now arrived in Oregon after 72 days. 
We are in the Hell's Canyon, the deepest canyon in North America, a good 2,400 meters lower than the surrounding mountains. Hi. Hi. Oh, there is free shade over there. <laughs> I didn't expect to find the highest temperature of the entire route between Idaho and Oregon. It gets over 110 Fahrenheit in the shade, about 43 degrees according to a ranger, and we cyclists have to ride in the sun. It's awful. That's Oregon. At least this part of Oregon. Not that far from Idaho. Idaho was looking like this before. So I overcrossed the Snake River, I think it's called. Towns are very small over here. I'm heading to a town called Halfway. No kidding, that's a name. So what is good about the United States and uh, especially the West is that uh, the traffic is very, very low. It has some negative side, of course. That means less services, less telephone signal, uh, less gas station, simply less people around. Whether it's good or bad, but when you need people, and you don't find anybody, that can be a problem. Prohibitive heat, very little shade, wind, risk of thunderstorm, high humidity and a tire that lose pressure made my 73rd day really bitter. I'm crossing a semi-desert area and it's a shame to cross it in a bad mood because it's really beautiful out here. But the reason why nobody wants to live here is also obvious. There is a lack of water and consequently life. In Baker City I wanted to stay only one night, but I took a second. I am very tired and overwhelmed by that happy melancholy of finishing a fantastic adventure. Finally and sadly. In Oregon, the Transamerica goes through several mountain passes. They are not as high as those in the Rockies, but they are frequent, even more than one a day. Oregon has also a lot to offer in terms of beauty and diversity. A Transamerica made from east to west is like a book that reserves its most exciting parts for you at the end. Here is the key to everything.
Prineville, I feel like I have left the West behind. I have now entered a large, rather populated valley with frequent cities. I feel the nearby coast, which is in fact beyond the last obstacle, the coastal range. It's day 78. Tomorrow I could ride from Sisters to Eugene. I would therefore finish this mission in 79 days. Instead, I decided to take a day off in order to finish this journey in around an evocative 80 days. That's how I decided to visit Crater Lake, but I went there by car. Sisters, Sisters Oregon, day 80. Today is my last day. I don't want to cycle no more. My goal is Eugene. There is so many miles ahead and the K McKenzie Pass is like a hundred miles. Will I be able to do this? I don't think so. It's already 18 past 10. To cross the coastal range, the Transamerica offers one of its most spectacular points, the McKenzie Pass known for its high mountain lava landscapes. I then rushed down the Pacific side of the range through the most beautiful and lush tall forest I ever seen. As in an epical race, the last stage is also the longest. I arrive among the lights of the city, which is now dark, incredulous, happy, but at the same time, sad. I have never been a sportsman, I have never been competitive, and I don't know well the thrill of victory. A victory without a team, and without an audience, a purely internal goal. I will have time to think, to find the old routine, to sober up this hangover of memories and emotions but not before finally seeing the Pacific Ocean. I set off with the intention of knowing my limits, of knowing if it was within my reach to pedal 80 kilometers a day for 80 days. And now I know. And I know that, in general, we can do a lot more than we believe, if we believe in it.